It's hard for me to introduce Peter Marx because uh, I know too much. <laughs> and uh, he pointed out to me that we met about 35 years ago at Xerox when uh, Tony Afuso brought us both in to talk about design engineering, manufacturing, and uh, psychology. And uh, Peter's accomplishments would themselves uh, easily fill a large book, but he asked me just to mention that he wrote what was probably the first book on CAE. He chaired the first public conferences on PDM and on uh, rapid prototyping, which today we call 3D printing. Uh, he had one client tally up just over a billion dollars of um, incremental revenue from a methodology that he developed called uh, customer dollar appeals. And at COFES, he's given a number of presentations, including about customer buying behavior, uh, knowledge turns, which are not a kind of seagull, but uh, uh, innovation infrastructure and the coming recession. And one of my favorites, a presentation on something Peter calls blind spotting which is uh, an amazing set of insights that I encourage you to ask him about. So with great uh, joy and uh, delight, I'd like to introduce my friend Peter Marks. Thanks, Joel. You can hook me up. <clears throat> thank you, Joel, and, and, and thank you, George. That was terrific. That was really great. Well, shortly a, a slide's going to come up, and I'm going to forewarn you that the, one of the words on that is nurture. And I know that's one of the last things you expect or want to hear from an engineer. Uh, and, but I hope at the, uh, at the end of that, it'll actually uh, perhaps make a, 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 a bit of sense to you. Well, I'm going to, uh, may, I'm going to in using the time here a little bit, uh, do, do any, we, how many folks are like baby boomers here? I have a pretty good thing here. How many of you um, actually remember the guidebook that your mother used to, well, there we have, Nurturing the Future. So, <clears throat> how many folks uh, recognize this guy? How many? One, two, three, okay, okay we've got a few. And, and who is it? Spock. Spock? Dr. Benjamin Spock. Dr. Benjamin Spock was the handbook writer that our mothers used. For 52 years, his was the most popular book sold in the United States after the Bible. And so, we had like maybe six hands go up. How many folks recognize this guy? <laughs> All right, that's Mr. Spock, Chief Science Officer. And, and kind of the, the way this talk is going to go, I'm going to tell you some things I've learned about Nurture 1.0. We've actually learned a ton of stuff since the original Dr. Benjamin Spock about how you raise kids and suggests that that's a metaphor for how we might better greet the future in what might be called Nurture 2.0. Now, let's frame the problem here. We spent a lot of time, particularly in the Sustainability Forum, talking about all of these big problems. We got lots of little problems, but we have, and this could list, could be 50 pages long. I just decided to give the folks in the back the, the slightest chance of reading here. We have created so many systems that are too big to fail that failure becomes, you know, it, it isn't the isolated Darwin moment where you take out like one, you know, stupid young guy at a time. If we take a whole economy out of time or, or you know, bees go, agriculture, we're in deep trouble. And what we know about a lot of these problems is that if I, if I say, well, that's your problem, your fault, that's a problem not solved. If I say that's my problem and take responsibility, it's a problem that has a possible solution. And so what I would suggest to, to us as engineers, we are the ones who have built about, you know, 60% of these complex systems. There is one idea of maybe you know, smaller nuclear plants, an internet, two point, you know, have a set, you know, making systems that if they fail, they degrade gracefully. And there's also the issue of how do we get people to pay attention? If you go into our Congress, we have nine techies. 
we have two physicists, six engineers, and one uh, biochemist amidst a sea of 240 lawyers. Now, I love having one lawyer in this group here, but we've got to find a way to be a bit more, you know, a bit more effective. So, here's, here's the thought. Does anybody have a granddaughter, a child about this age? Anybody? Yeah, so Joel, of course. So, so let, me, let me take your... So, <laughs> that, could, that, that could be your daughter. Now, what if I say, I have actually done this incredible new kind of look at, you know, the, the, what's happening with the world out today and all that kind of stuff. I've run the equations, and I've predicted that at the age of 15, your daughter is going to run off and join the circus. Now, how, how are you going to react to that? I'll do everything I can. To yeah, everything I can. You know, so, and, and in fact, and if I forecast to go, actually, it's not quite clear. It may be the circus, or it may be a graduate degree at MIT. <laughs> you know, so, so the real issue is with things like weather. I mean, you know, how, how many folks here think that maybe pumping, you know, a trillion tons of carbon dioxide might not be a good thing. Not quite sure. You know, so there's some thought about that. But there's a whole bunch of folks who go, well, it's not our fault, it's not a problem. How do we have that dialogue? And what I'm going to su suggest is that we kind of work on a prediction or a forecasting mentality, but maybe there's a nurture model that we actually, more of us might agree on. You know, how can we nurture the future? So let's, let's think about nurture since Spock 1.0. There are Five key things I've learned, I'm not an expert on child development, but in reading through the literature and stuff like that, there are five key things that I'd like to share with you. One is how you start, secure attachment. Delayed gratification is actually one that probably Spock kind of missed. He didn't talk about peer groups, didn't talk about mastery. So head start. We all come into this world a marvelous, as every human being, bundle of genes, and we have some unique ones that make us, you know, you know, exceptionally good or exceptionally bad at various things. And there's this immense entanglement. For those of you who know American football, these are the, uh, the three Mannings, Archie and his two Super Bowl winning quarterback sons. It's incredibly hard to disentangle how much of their success is genes and how much of that, or nature, and how much of that is nurture, you know, playing football and the rest of that. But we have done twin studies and a whole bunch of stuff and in general, the general rule of thumb of about half of its nature and half of its nurture. Now, there is an incredible talk yet to be given on how nature affects what's going on. We've discovered all kinds of stuff that Dr. Spock never knew about genetics and mapping and all the rest of that. That's not this talk. We're going down the path of, of nurture. Now, the next one is something called secure attachment. How many folks is that? Yeah, I didn't know what secure attachment was either. So, secure attachment is this notion that at a toddling age, a kid develops almost a map of the world. And that map of the world goes, I'm securely attached to someone, maybe my grandparent, and with that, I can go out and explore the world. Bigelow, when he took those knobs off of all of those doors and stuff like that, that was a securely attached kid. That was a kid who was ready to go out and explore and do things. Now, since Spock, one of the things we've done is there's been this huge study on adverse childhood experiences. And an adverse childhood experience has come from your know, parents are divorced, you've been raped, you, you saw somebody killed, you've, uh, you've been... I mean, there's a, lots and lots of things that can cause those. And, and kids have a ton of these things, but the thing is, is that if you have four or more of these adverse childhood experiences, and some kids and some families have one just about every week, you are more likely to get pregnant as a teen, more likely to drop out of a job, You'll have, you're less likely to have a job, and just in health, things like alcoholism, up 500%, injected drug use, up over 1,000%. The outlook, if you have these adverse childhood experiences, is terrible, but if you have secure rather than avoidant or insecure attachment to at least one caregiver, that seems to inoculate against that. So we lose a whole bunch of our kids through less than secure attachment. But if you have it, it really... And, and it's interesting, if you actually go through famous people in history, like of our recent presidents, a whole bunch of them, you know, grew up without fathers. So you've got... You've got uh, and, and then a whole bunch of them had of fathers, like, you know, uh, Bush and Romney and McCain, you know, trying to get there that had fathers said, kids, you'll never make it. You know, the black sheep of the thing. So there is this thing of adversity is kind of good in some cases. Think about Jobs and Ellison. Two, two 
orphans with a chip on their shoulder, but securely attached enough from their own families that they could go on to, to do good things. So the lesson here, the secure attachment thing, is you really want to have a kid who has a map of the future that says, I have enough security that I can go out and explore rather than I've been so, you know, my environment has left me cowering in the corner or just vibrating in the place that mad at stuff. So delayed gratification. Has everybody here heard, seen or heard the Walter Michelle marshmallow test? How many, how, yeah, so, it's, so the, the notion here is that if you take a kid now about four or five years old and you put him in a room and say, look, you can have one marshmallow now, but if you wait a while, we'll give you two. And so the experimental leaves the room and the kids the fidget and they go like this and they try to distract themselves. And at the end of 15 minutes, only about 30% of kids can actually delay gratification. But those 30% of kids go on to have higher SAT scores, do better in life, be healthier. I mean, it's actually, if you had a choice between a kid who scored highly on delayed gratification and, and who had 170 IQ, the delayed gratification kid is likely to turn out better, to have more success in life. Now, this is, delayed gratification is an amazing thing. You've heard the notion of, you know, one bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. These are kids who are saying, one bird, but wait, there's two in the bush. <laughs> They're doing a form of time travel. They're literally saying, I f I, it starts with security, but I feel good enough about my capabilities. I've learned enough that, that I myself can get that better future outcome. And adversity is part of that. This is something Spock kind of missed. It's actually kind of a good thing. The idea of, of you know, falling down and getting up again is a terrific thing. So this is the third milestone on the way to having your daughter, you know, really kind of, you know, kind of work the way you want. The next thing is that, and this is uh, Dahlia, Joel's wife, was the one who kind of turned me on to some of this nurture stuff, and so she pointed me to a book. It turns out that when your daughter hits her sort of preteen years, you are no longer in charge. Peer groups do the education. We've got, a, we've got a lot of influence, but we divide ourselves into geeks and nerds and jocks. And about the only, only power you have over these peer groups is to say, am I going to move a neighborhood where my daughter's choice is cheerleader or nerd rather than Crips and Bloods? That's the power we've got. And if you think about the power of peer groups, it extends throughout life. I mean, one of the things that that George showed us two of the coolest peer groups you could ever imagine. The PC crew that he started with and this IAS group that, that, that went beyond that. So we learn in peer groups, that's very powerful. If your daughter ends up running with the right crowd, that's a good sign, we're, we're moving along here. And then l lastly, we want our kids to master some skill. And even if it's just the experience of mastering a skill that may not you know, be their life work or something like that, that discipline is useful. Just as a rough heuristic, there's, there's questions about it. It takes about 10,000 hours to get really good at something. That's how long you have to pass a, you know, a football as a Manning kit early on. It's about how long it takes to, uh, you know, uh, uh, get a medical degree, how long it takes to do a startup and stuff. So if your daughter, maybe through color or something, masters a skill, has put in the effort and stuff like that, you have gone through all five steps of nurture and you've greatly increased the probability of success. You follow me? This, this makes sense to you? So there are some nurture 1.0 applications. For example, if you actually wanted to have a war on poverty, you would actually want to pay attention to some of these things early on. We were thinking about STEM. And, and most of us, when we think about STEM, we go, What's wrong with kids today is they don't know enough differential equations, or they need to know more about robotics. But if you back that thing, what the power of, of first is really is the peer group. Are there peer groups to be formed for kids who just aren't that much into robots, but might be into something else? And if in fact, if you could, if you look at this as just kind of a throughput thing, you know, we lose at least 10% of our kids at the secure attachment. And it's not an either or thing, it's kind of a gradation. I mean, you know, there was a famous 47% don't turn out too well. So we lose a bunch there. Only 30% really end up 
you know, super, uh, you know, willing to, to go to the third step and start a company and fail and then start another company and fail and then do it the third time and really succeed. And so, so anyhow, there's a bunch of applications and this is good stuff to know and hopefully you will forgive me for, for telling you something that I've learned about nurture. But let's, let's, let's move on. What I would suggest to you is this is also an approach for thinking about the future. If you think about childhood potential, and by enterprise potential, I don't mean spaceship enterprise. I mean your career, your team, your company, the nation. At some higher level, you've got that, uh, and we'll have an idea there, that this map that a child has of can I venture forth into the world, can I succeed, can, is actually paralleled in our world with what I'll call maps of discovery. And while many of them are actual maps, I'm using it, the term kind of metaphorically here, that delayed gratification is our own problem with ha not having short-term thinking. It's exactly the same problem. That positive peer groups, now that everybody's you know, walking around like this, is, it needs a new name, so we're gonna call it social workspace. And there's some really interesting challenges there. And that it, it's not just mastery once, but your daughter over a career, you know, if you take five years, 10,000 hours, is going to have 10 lives. And maybe one will be raising a kid, and one will be failing at a startup, and one will be playing a musical instrument, and three will be doing... I mean, we, we have these, these 10 lives to spend, and, 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 and so we have to master not just as individuals, but as all of us together. So let's start. Future potential. Well, what genes are to nurture 1.0, memes are. The recipes we have for success, the ideas, the heuristics, the, the, the heritage of the sort that George was telling us. And, and just as we have gene selection to kind of get better, we have, we have issues with meme selection. How do we decide what are good memes? That these things apply at all these levels, career, team, company. And we've heard this notion that Isaac Newton said, if I've seen further than others, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of others. So if we look at our means of selection, one of the problems we've got is that sometimes we choose to stand on the shoulders of midgets. And so just as a, as a, as a notion here, does anybody recognize the guy up top? Yeah, that's Bill Nye the science guy. You are probably one of the 2.1 million Google hits he gets. But standing on the bare shoulders of Paris Hilton, we have 21 million hits. So that's, that's one issue. And the other thing is that we have this cultural bias, all of us, that is backward looking. It's not just the Amish, it's engineers, it's, it, you know. So, so when we have an intern who says, I'm thinking about going to ASU or, or Caltech, everybody goes, oh, go to Caltech. You know, so that's, that's kind of this bias that we've got for the past. So, so the suggestion I'm wondering about here is, what's the equivalent to, a, to giving birth or adopting to a baby of adopting the future? How do you care about it? How do you engage with it? How do you make it something that's central to your life, to your company, to your nation, or whatever? And I'm going to make a half-hearted suggestion here. Uh, the usual approach we have for companies or when a kid gets 18 is, kid, take a piece of the past and carry it forward. Uh, spread democracy through the world by joining the, the, you know, the service for the next bit. Go on a mission. Uh, uh, you know, take over the family farm. Uh, why don't you become an engineer like me? That's the usual approach. And that's actually, it's a positive thing to preserve the past. There's a lot, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't still be here if there wasn't something positive about that. But we don't do enough of saying, what's the future? And I would say the way you adopt the future is with a question. You ask yourself, what's the one thing that I'm curious about that no one knows the answer to. And when an Intel science thing, when the kids, you know, actually go, when, when a 16-year-old kid or a 15-year-old kid explores something that no one knows the answer to, not just replicating the same, you know, baking soda and acetic acid experiment for the millionth time, uh, that's marvelous. And so my suggestion is, is kind of twofold. Is wouldn't it be cool if we had a future call, core? Not the Peace Corps, not joining the Army, but a kid says, you know, where I am today, I'm just interested in this, and over the next two years, you're going to get the support to do that. Another way of thinking about that is, uh, you know, like with our interns and ourselves, we go, well, what do you do? 
you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. We don't ask, what are you interested in? What questions are you going to solve? And the rest of that. So, so I, I'm suggesting that of our ten lives, that, that we devote at least one of them to a question, and that we, as, as a culture, we think consciously about the questions that are not yet answered that we want to answer. So that's, that's thought number one. Thought number two, as the kids are getting this map of secure attachment, and by securely and securely attached, and I would suggest that maybe even more than metaphorically, there's a very direct link to, to maps of discovery. If you think about Columbus and how he had the cojones to go out and explore the world and stuff like that, part of it was because as there were maps that said, I'm securely attached to my known world. There are these pieces out there that seem highly probable. And then there's this, we don't quite understand it, but it seems to be there. That just as a child's mental map of their space, you know, leads them to go out and discover, so our maps in every discipline kind of give us that, that kind of courage. So, I want to think first about how we map ourselves in time. I'm going to give some, some, you know, ideally we all live in like three time zones. We respect our past, we enjoy the present, we think about the future. But almost every one of us spends a little bit more time living in one time zone, a little bit more than the other. So I'm going to give you three profiles, and as I'm going through, kind of think of which one you kind of fit in. So those who kind of live in the past, Every time you talk to them, they go, that reminds me of a story, or they keep telling the same story again and again. You know, the, 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 the past perfect is the tense that they like to live in. They routine, they have a lot of brand loyalty, you know, they buy the same products their parents did or whatever. Uh, they, they buy stuff to keep up, more likely to watch the History Channel or Civil War reenactments, you know, than other stuff. And so they're, they're really kind of bound by the past. This vision of, of what was good in the past is how they wanted to live their, their, their life in the future. So that's kind of one real rough profile. The present is kind of governed by I want. Give me, give me right now. There's no calendar. We don't put stuff on calendar. I'm living in the moment. It's all flow. Uh, the money spent on impulse purchases, often to the, the point of going in debt, but they do save money on things like insurance and condoms and, you know, stuff like that. So there, there's that. Um, there's couch surfing, and they're bound by, he, he, you know, hedonism. What feels good in the present? Now, again, we all live in this, and we all, you know, have this peace. And then the future people will go, well, I'll put that on the calendar. They've got these long to-do lists. Then when it comes time to look at products, they do a lot of brand research, you know, figure out what's best and go to consumer reports. They save for an IRA. They're much more likely to go like a Star Trek convention than to a Civil War reenactment. And, and they, they spend a lot of time themselves living in the future. Now, this research has never been done, so we're going to do it right now here. If you had to say, I live more in one area than not, how many would say you're kind of living in the past? Okay, we got, you know, we'll, we'll notice that, that as, uh, the, the, the great legal precedents, maybe that's an appropriate role. How many would say you're living in the present? Yeah, we've got a few that are kind of like enjoying life. They've got smiles on their faces. And how many would say you're living in the future? Yeah, though, so this is not a real surprise at a conference that says Conference on the Future of Engineering Software. <laughs> but the point that I want to bring to you is you are living in a different time zone than most of the other 7.3 billion people on this world. And when we talk to those other people, we're like, like, American tourists abroad, if we only yell louder about rationality and calculation, they'll understand. But just another point here. Uh, there's this huge liberal, you know, conservative divide in the U.S. And it's a gr very, you know, rough sort of thing, but if you're conservative about a given subject, you're kind of bound by some vision of the perfect past, and which probably doesn't quite exist. And if you're progressive about this thing, you're probably bound by some vision of the future, which also is kind of idealized. Now, it looks to me like when liberals and conservatives are, or progressives are yelling at each other, they're not, they're not angry about each other's vision of the past. Hey, the Constitution's a good thing. You know, that was great. Or their visions of the future. Yeah, it'd be cool to go to Mars. They're arguing about the people living in the present, the hedonics. They're arguing about those, what are those slum people doing? What are those Goldman Sachs people doing? And, and so, 
literally our argument isn't with each other, it's about this other group of people, and the conservatives are saying, stop enabling them, and the liberals are saying, why aren't you helping them? So, so maybe we don't have to yell so loud is my, my point there. Uh, Phil Zimbardo at Stanford actually maps your time orientation much more uh, specifically. He talks about past negative. You know, there are some people who, I mean, like PTSD is an example of that, that are so held to uh, bad things that happened in the past that they can't get by that. And he's kind of sketching an ideal personality profile. If, if you spend all your time in a past negative past, you've got problems. You need to get therapy. It'll screw up your life and the rest. On the past positive, boy, my parents brought me up. I love school. I keep coming back to COFES. That was a really cool talk. That past positive stuff is, you know, that, that gives us a firm foundation for moving in the future. And the present, he said, there's present fatalists who are going, well, no matter what I do, nothing will happen. I might as well just sit and enjoy myself. And there are people who are present hedonists. We actually have, how many people are like Brad and Dick Morley, they like chocolate? Yeah, so I mean, there, so, so there's, there, there, that's a little, you know, we all have our, and hedonism gives us the energy to move forward. It's actually, a, you know, a pretty positive thing. Then looking in the future, there's the, the, the COFES types, and there's also the transcendental futurists, where the people are going, like, the reason I'm behaving now is because of karma or heaven and hell or something like that. So we all have all of these kind of profiles in us, but they are different. So, and, and the other thing is we, we actually live in multiple universes. So there are some people that thinks the world is 13.7 billion years old, year old, maybe 1% who could explain why. A whole bunch of people are convinced that it's six to 10,000 years old. Um, it, today, if you, just, if you just look at eyewitness reports for anything, they're notoriously inaccurate. If you actually want to do physics, I've discovered a remarkable physics experiment you can do with a TV. If you merely, on any given day, switch between Fox News and MSNBC, you have just proven the existence of parallel and multiple universes. <laughs> now, in 30 years from now, 30 years from now, we can't even agree on what the weather's going to be. You know, so we've got that issue. 10,000 years, some people think they can build a clock when the pharaohs screwed up, you know, even 45 years later, and who knows what, you know, uh, humanity's thing is. So how do we bridge this kind of, these incredibly different perceptions? How do we get this longer-term thinking? This is a hard problem. You know, I spent all this time looking at blind spotting. Uh, has anybody read the book Thinking Fast and Slow, Danny Kahneman? Yeah, terrific book. And I, I talked to him, so, okay, we know this stuff, what do we do? And he goes, I don't know, you know? So, so here's, a, here's a suggestion. If you think about secure attachment to the future, we do build these maps. Here's a map after Columbus, but kind of before Lewis and Clark, where we kind of know the U.S., but there's this great unexplored area. There's actually a little bit of fibbing about where the Mississippi is. But a map like this gives you two things. One says, you know, like, like how many think that there are liberal and conservative GPSs? No, we don't think that way because it's a map that we can verify. Now, we get mad because sometimes it's not right. And, and, but a good map, a good map of discovery is rooted in facts that you can observe, provides data, but kind of puts the error you know, rates around it on stuff that you think is out there, and puts this, this for the curious, this, this immense open space saying, wouldn't that be cool to find about? And it turns out that right now, engineers more than anybody else have these two incredibly cool roles in creating maps of discovery. You know, the Archimedes, Da Vinci's, et cetera, were actually keen observers. They actually drew these maps. But there are also the people who built the tools, microscopes, the telescopes, the strain gauges, to actually enable the mapping process. And we, more than any past generation, are living in the golden age of mapping. Uh, we've seen the 2MP as the two myo parataxis presentations, where you just take something attached to a phone and you use it to measure slip, or you use it to measure 3D. And if you think of, the, the, just in the last couple decades, we have, you can, you, you can go to Google Earth and find any spot on, on the planet. There, the seven billion isn't the population of the world. We're at another one of these crossing over points. That's the population of cell phones in the world. We are literally crossing over in 2014 of that. Uh, G, we've got GPS to things. We've got, if you name something you want to sense, 
including, you know, put their mental effort. We, we can actually, you know, portable fMRIs and things like that. You can do that. Uh, we've got these maps processing. So, so we are in an age where the, if you've got a question, you can map the known part of it. You can get other people to do that. There's a sensor for anything. And we create these incredible maps, but we have not mapped species, oceans, inner earth, the ribosome. You know, we've got the genome, but not the ribosome. The neurome, the connectome. Carbon mapping, you know, so we, haven't, we haven't done that, and we're going about the wrong way. We're trying to do carbon accounting rather than carbon mapping. Uh, planets, asteroids, viruses, Nate, we don't, uh, nobody knows what's inside of North Korea. We don't know best practices. So, so I mean, there is, this, this, could, this page could be infinitely large because that's how large the opportunity is. And the engineers who create those maps that others can trust will, will have done a tremendous service. And the engineers who create the list of sensors that should be 100 times longer, you know, have a business in front of them. And we also have these crucial social applications. It's not just mapping our own interest, you know, however, however narrow that may be, but whether it's mapping, you know, uh, geology of uh, where I live, uh, earthquake, or just taking issues like, okay, so now corporations are people and they can spend as much money as they want, but the Supreme Court says it's just fine to say this, this, this political announcement brought to you from the AFL-CIO, this one from the Koch brothers and stuff, we should be mapping that stuff. Our role as engineers is to have transparency, something I think most of us can agree on, just so you can map where stuff it is. And for almost any social problem, there's a map to be built. So, so what secure attachment is to kids, I'm suggesting that this infinite variety of really cool maps is to society, is to our work. And in fact, maybe next year at COFES, we go, show me your map, which could be genome or, or something like that. So longer-term decision-making, this is the, the same issue of delayed gratification amongst kids. And we've talked in past years about the 150-plus short-term you know, biases and filters that do that. And we are quite literally trying to run complex civilizations with 50,000-year-old operating systems. And they're biased very much towards, let me escape the saber-toothed tiger not to, I wonder if it's a good thing to eat lunch and dinner at McDonald's for the next 40 years. So, so there's that issue. Um, one of the cool things about so many of the experiments is that chocolate is used in at least 12 major experiences to prove that, that people trying to do the right thing are easily dissuaded, and chocolate figures in that. I still haven't figured out whether Dick Morley is, just loses 50 IQ points when he, when he eats a lot of chocolate, uh, he's got, he doesn't, you know, he can lose them, who cares, but, because uh, he'll get them right back. Or if he's just, you know, making the rest of us uh, go there. Uh, other, I mean, this is, this is one that shocked even me, who's used to this. They did a study of people seeking pardons and going before a judge. And in the morning, so, the, and these people come in, you know, tons of them, randomly, and in the morning, if you're up for pardon, you know, you've done insider trading on high-performance computing or something like that, uh, you have a 70% chance of getting a pardon, and that drops to about 10% as blood sugar levels and tiredness increases, and then you have a break and you come back. See, now we're ready for a break. People go, shut up, move on, Pete. So, so, and then it comes up again, and that repeats three times during the day. That is just absolutely shocking in terms of our own rationality and decision-making, yet Yet, there you are. Uh, I, I show this one back uh, in that we're going to have a recession. Here's why slide of, th you know, 40% of our profits were all of a sudden, you know, made by Goldman Sachs and Enron and stuff like that, and that isn't good. We're doing exactly the same thing right now with high-frequency trading, and nobody's really noticing. And I think most of you have seen the gorilla movie. I mean, we've got elephants flying under the radar and, and not seeing them. So the issue here is really... What are marshmallows to different people in time? You know, for, if I'm passing, boy, I remember the time when I was a kid and we had a campfire and marshmallows were really great. If it's present, give me my marshmallows now. If it's future-oriented, it's kind of like a thesis on the better toasting through, you know, a plasma of marshmallows or something like that. How do, we, how do we move people from these different time zones into the same area? And so what I'm really suggesting is that we literally think about the time orientations of people who are necessary for us to work together and travel in time together. About the same time that Joel and I met at Xerox, actually a couple years later, I went 
uh, to Japan and met Yotaro Kobayashi, who was the head of Fuji Xerox, who actually turned about the guy who turned Xerox onto the quality movement and stuff like that. Kobayashi was an incredibly impressive guy. He was like this samurai warrior who spoke impeccable English and graduated at the top of his Wharton business class. And what he did with Fuji Xerox, with engineers stuck in the old mentality of giant copiers and stuff, is he said, look, I, he respected their past, he understood it, he empathized, but he said, but if we don't make these smaller machines more effective for the futures, where will we be? And so that was his way of doing time travel. Um, we heard last year, I, I, uh, about the same time, I met Chuck House, and, and the thing I remember from Chuck House, he said, you know, we've been looking at all the problems we face in time, and it takes us three times to get anything right. And, and, and it looks like Microsoft's the same way. The, you know, Windows wasn't worth the damn until 3.0. And, and HP later, in, the, in its prime, actually leveraged the knowledge that it wasn't going to get it right the first time or the second time in a hinge point sort of thing. So anticipating the future is powerful there. We, we're in a conference that used to be kind of, you know, dominated by mechanical folks. I would suggest to you that we actually have something to learn from the architectural folks because they have to travel in time all the time. You try to put a new building down, particularly in a place like New York, and, and, and you've got somebody goes, what, you're going to take that tree out? Somebody living in the past. You've got somebody goes, no way I'm going to go through the traffic in the present and other people and things. So this whole negotiation of different time zones is something they have to go through with, with every new building and, and perhaps not in an organized way, but in some way they, they get good at that. So let's go to the next thing, the equivalent of the peer groups. Um, you, you described some of the coolest peer groups ever. And you talked about, uh, one of the things we know about peer groups is high conflict, high respect is powerful. So today, you know, as adults, we don't go, well, here's our peer group. It isn't good to be back at COFES. Um, we have issues. We all live in ghettos of the imagination. Now, you've probably all seen North Korea and South Korea at night. I mean, that just... Just the social aspect of those countries is so different, you can see it from space. Same people, same genes, roughly the same resources, and one lights up at night, and the other is impoverished and can barely turn on the lights. And we talk about people who actually live in, you know, trapped in other ghettos, but if you decide as a smart, young, bright kid to take the job at Golden Sachs, you've joined another ghetto. And if you look county by county, at, at, at throughout the U.S., we are in ghettos. There was a Pew Research uh, study that said th the dominant reason for both conservatives and liberals in picking where to move is to be with people who think just like me. So we engineer it. We're, we're in ghettos too. This isn't this isn't other people. This is us, us too. I'd I'd love to spend an hour on this. I've been doing a whole lot of research on what I believe has happened of how territorial instincts have actually been co-opted by territories of belief. The, the thing, and, and you can see, you know, sort of two things here. The thing that I want you to take away from this slide is we're stuck between kind of two, two poles. One is the smaller, tighter, trustier group feels good. So it's a small workspace, a small tribe, heavily defended walls and stuff like that. But Innovation comes from this wider, more accepting, broader kind of a group. And most of the, whether it's an immigration issue or who gets health care issue, they have a part of this, this kind of dynamic. It's also sales versus marketing, the silos in our company and the rest of that. So we've got this, there's good things about tight-knit communities, but they also can become ghettos of the imagination. And there's good things about diverse communities they can, they can be highly imaginative, but they're also less secure. You're more likely, I mean, if you think of the Trojan horse, a tight-knit community would say, no way we're going to let that in. And, and a wide-open community would say, well, isn't that cool? Come on in. So, so pluses and minuses either ways. Um, yeah. Uh, be, because the instincts, for, uh, John, John's question is, I, at the very thing I put, fast thinking and slow thinking, sort of as a reference to Danny Kahneman, most of our instinctual biases 
are towards security and fear and defense. In fact, the research shows that progressives and liberals and people who are open to experience that psychological profile actually, when threatened, turn into conservatives. And so, so when you, when you, all the, 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 the innate biases tend towards this uh, to avoid fear, think fast. I mean, it's a little bit like if I see somebody new, and like, let's say you're a, you know, kind of a black guy late at night or something like that, and I don't know you, and I, you know, my instinct might be, oh, that's a scary guy if I'm living on that side. And my instinct if I'm living on that side might be, hey, man, it's really cool to see you, my name's Pete. And, and so those two, that's the tension that, that fits there. And there's actually been studies of prejudice where it just takes you actually milliseconds longer if somebody's part of them, not your, your in-group, to actually make that, that decision. So that, that was the, the slow thing. We can pick maybe more of it up later. <laughs> so that what mediates this is the trust that we have. It's easy to have trust in a small group. It's harder to have trust in a larger group. There are, there are probably 50 different kind of takes at trust, but one of the, the, the better known ones is what's called Dunbar's number who plotted brain size and the size of the social group amongst primates. And it turns out if you're really, really smart like humans, you can have a social group, a natural social group of about 150 people. This is about, you know, think about, you know, you may have 5,000 Facebook and LinkedIn friends, but if you think about the people that you trust with your life or you in fact know well enough to know not to trust with your life, it's a pretty small number. And so, so the, one, of the, one of the questions for humanity is how do we get really smart so we can, because some of our problems you know, are, are, are not 150 people at a time problems. So we, you know, one of the issues for social workspaces, do we have fear or trust? You know, most of the old media, printing presses and you know, on the radio is kind of like the million of us will be very fearful of the enemy, that will increase solidarity, will draw the, the lines around us, but to innovate, you know, we need to, to go think. It's, it's interesting that with the internet, if you look at internet, Usenet, World Wide Web, it was all engineers saying, now we can communicate. And, and now we've got all these, you know, these kind of new technologies. Trust comes from a whole bunch of things. Trust comes from seeing you eye to eye. I, I see pupil size for interest. I, there, there's a whole cool thing on mirror neurons. Skin tone, we are, we are so, Humans are better than just about any other animal at detecting slight shades of redness because that tells us when somebody is embarrassed, when they're angry. It's part of our trust mechanism. Micromusculature, the equivalent body language, the tells in poker, those are the things where it's not, it's not a perfect system. You know, where there's still the Andy Madoffs in the world, though they're often not face-to-face -face that do that, but that's how, how we mediate this. Um, you know, there's a lot made of uh, engineers with Asperger's. These are people who may have decided to, you know, inadvertently decided that some of the neurons would be you know, better devoted to something else besides mirroring and, and trust of people and stuff like that. The interesting thing about the internet, we don't know if it's by plan or not, is that it makes everyone at a keyboard, it gives them Asperger's. Because we don't have these mirroring things. You know, no matter how many smileys and emoticons we go, we still can't judge intentions validly. So the engineering challenge here is two that I would put for you. Every one of us is going to have this bias of, I want to be with people just like me, but if you want to be productive, you need to have somebody who argues with me, who doesn't think just like me. And you gave a case of the arguments that were there. And so you literally have to consciously go, in my social workspace, I need to bring people that I respect but who will disagree with me. Hard thing to do, but it's, a, it's a, a positive thing to do. And the other issue is, how do we scale up our social workspaces so that it's bigger than 150? Because whether it's a big building or a plane or a nation, you know, you, that, that's just not enough people to deal with the complexity that we face. And what I will suggest to you, there is this another incredible opportunity facing us to, to do technologies of trust. Now, we've been doing this at very low levels so far. We've got security encryption, and we've learned to, you know, detect Nigerian princes who want to do us a favor if we just give them their bank account number. And censorship filtering, Bitcoin's interesting because it's actually, it is also a mechanism for distributed 
uh, you know, intellectual property rights, if you, if you thought about that, ratings and reviews. And, uh, now think about this. What distinguishes that the real value added for eBay might be trusted sellers, and the real value added for Amazon might be trusted reviews. And those new mechanisms of trust, as crude as they are, are probably worth a billion dollars each, maybe more. Uh, predictable interaction. So you know, I, I actually met in, in a line once a woman who married her husband because they had been gaming for two years separated by two continents and got to know each other. So there, you know, there's that kind of thing. Tra simultaneous, trans you know, if, you're, if we're sitting here in a company and there's the, the Chinese software crew over there and the Indian, you know, there, there's a lack of trust. And this, the notion of simultaneous translation builds trust. So we have just scratched the surface. You know, online polygraph, simulation, reputation, durable identity, to the, to the extent that we can create new mechanisms of digital trust, digital empathy, that's probably digital respect, that is incredibly powerful. And we see that just playing out in our own companies. I would, I would suggest to you that one of the big differences between, say, PTC and SolidWorks in, in, in the early days wasn't just the choice of platforms, it was the trust that was developed or not developed between the users and the company. So this, I mean, it's, it's a very powerful factor. And uh, it, whoever in this room invents a new cool mechanism of digital trust will, will become you know, insanely rich, insanely successful, and, and, uh, and do good things. So let's go down to the last thing of mastery here. Uh, you know, it's said that a cat has nine lives. And as we explained for your daughter, she has at least ten lives to spend. You know, my wife said to me, that doesn't, you know, really look like a master thing. He kind of looks like old, like you Kofos guys. And I said, actually, I know that guy. It's Mike Riddle. And, 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 and he's, he's, you know, continually reinvented him. And right behind him, with 10,000 hours under his belt, is Dallas, his son. So, so the question is, and this is really, uh, Paul Saffo yesterday did a great job of talking about um, how do we time things so we spend mastery. So the first thing I want to point out, you know, there's this like curiosity killed the cat thing, not true. It was ignorance that killed the cat, and curiosity was framed. So we, we are driving this uh, this way. So out, let's think about outsourcing the learning curve. You know, we all know about the learning curve, the experience curve. Moore's Law is an example of the experience curve, uh, the product life cycle. The, it, even though we can't predict the future, once we've begun on a path, the, the path of that product or that service or that idea is somewhat predictable. Now, one of the, the crazy things we do is we try to outsource the learning curve. You know, made in, designed in Cupertino, made, you know, someplace else. This is a little bit like saying, I want to get really, really fit, but I'm rich, so I'm going to outsource the push-ups. You, you just can't do it. If you want to be fit for the future, you've got to do your own reps. And we, we've outsourced the, uh, the reps a lot of times. You know, RCA, mentioned as well in your talk, owned the consumer electronics. We had a TV industry and stuff. Now you can't find anything in consumer electronics, to, really to speak of, made here in the U.S. We, are, we decreased R&D funding first in companies and now in, in government. So we've decreased the reps. We financialized everything. Who needs to develop stuff when you can be Enron or Goldman Sachs and just you know, play with the money? That's, that's a good thing. We have the hubris of deciders in chief, whether it's the Bush administration that says, mission accomplished, boy, we, you know, that was easy, or whether it's the Obama administration saying, well, you know, who needs to worry about a website? I mean, surely, you know, the gearheads are going to take care of that. Um, we're just not paying attention to, to doing the hard work that, uh, that sits there. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about persevering and, and uh, uh, and timing equals future fit fitness, but if you're going to do those reps, you have to do them at the right time. You can't miss the wave. You know, Paul again talked a lot about that, but I do uh, do want to point out a couple things. I used to spend an elaborate time looking at kind of three phases. You know, the early adopter phase and the kind of customization phase where you had all these things, and then the the maturity phase where you're you're working less on product innovation but process innovation. One of the things that I that I didn't pay enough attention to and does represent 
an opportunity is soft landings. If we're going to move fr from less nukes or less sarin gas or you know, less coal plants, we have to engineer a soft landing for those things in order to create space you know, for the next thing. So it's a whole new, I mean, an engineer has a choice of given any technology, do I want to spend the 20 years in, in the early stages? Do I want to spend the five years in the customization where most of the money is? Do I want to do process innovation? You've, you've got those choices and you can time it. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is you can two time the life cycle. And what I mean by that is, is that almost everybody in this room thinks they're going to figure out when they're going to be successful by technology evolution. But you can often better gauge where the market is by customer buying decision evolution. So for example, how many folks here still just really love incandescent light bulbs? Yeah, we're still there. And how many people bought a whole bunch of CFLs? And how many are really happy with them? And how many people go, hey, I'm an early adopter, uh, 20 bucks for a, a light bulb or even 300 bucks for the Internet of Things ones is really, yeah, so we got some. So the point is, is that by understanding, and a, a product life cycle is made up of, if there's a million customers, a million buying decisions, some at the early stages, you know, and some at the middle stage and some of the light stages. So you can literally, if you do that research, triangulate, understand where market is. So I'll just leave you with that thought. ESP, how do, you, how do you understand magically what the future is? That is experimentation, simulation, and prototyping. And there's a whole nother discussion to be had about how lousy a job we have done at creating ESP tools. You know, it's like, hey, I've got this remarkable great idea. I'm going to put Nastran on a PC, and that'll be for, like, concept development. You know, it's not going to work. So, so there are some cool tools here. We've got the napkin. We've got Arduino. Uh, this one is actually a, a genetic sampling kind of thing. Maybe MATLAB, a lot of the other tools here. And we can also build our own tools, you know, whether it's in the shop or our own jigs. In, in, in my work, I built tools like customer appeals to help me kind of decide what's going on. So ESP, that's where you do the reps early on. Later on, I think if, if, if I were to put a knock on the industry, um, we have the Joel Orr approach to BIM and PLM. And the early Joel Orr approach is, let me save everything just in case I ever need it. As opposed to, let's make sure that I enjoy and get better at the reps as they're happening. So, so I mean, I, you know, I, I did do the first PLM conference, and one of the, the things that I've had ever since then is this notion of, uh, I have yet to see the engineer who comes to work and says, I can't wait to fire up my PLM system you know, leveraging that. So, so we're, we're still not there. So, um, and so really that's, that's, that's my thought for you is that if we want to affect change, whether it's in our daughters or whether it's in our careers, our companies, our nation, that these five steps just might be another model that more people could jump onto as opposed to, we'll predict the weather, we'll forecast the weather, let's nurture the weather, you know, let's, let's start measuring. And so to summarize, first adopt the future. And it starts with a question. Second, generate trustworthy maps. We are in the golden age of map making. There, there are incredibly powerful and clever maps to be made. The technology is there. There has never been more infrastructure to do this. There's been never, never been more business opportunity to do this. It would be interesting if we almost rephase our industry. Uh, industry is we're the people who draw maps, you know, of discovery. That's what CAD, you know, is. Delayed gratification, longer-term decision-making. The best provisional thought I can give now is that if you want to do that, you're leading an expedition across time. You're taking people from where they are today, the, few, the gratification they get there, and bringing them to where we're often living, which is in the future. Uh, positive peer groups are uh, vibrant social workspaces. And to the extent that we can, in our user groups, in our communities, you know, develop this kind of digital empathy. To, to take Den Dunbar's number from 150 to 1,000 or something like that, incredibly powerful. And for mastery, that's perseverance and timing. So that's a thought. I hope you don't find it too touchy-feely like the nurture stuff uh, would fit there. Uh, and I'm really suggesting, echoing, we can't predict the future. But once we forecasted it, maybe the way to share that vision is to nurture the future. That's it. Thank you very much.